Well, good evening. Good evening. It's good to see everyone here tonight. If you have your Bibles, would you join me in Numbers chapter 21? Numbers 21. Uh, without really intending to, this lesson tonight is actually another, uh, it deals with a tough topic. Um, I didn't know really that we were going to have two back-to-back. Last week we talked about kind of a tough topic, uh, but this week is another one. It's a topic, though, that doesn't usually come from within the family of faith, but usually from outside. So we'll look at this in Numbers chapter 21. It's an interesting chapter and it puts Israel right on the border of entering into the promised land. So before we do that, though, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's ask him to help us as we study together. <clears throat> Father, I thank you for today. Lord, I thank you for a beautiful day. Thank you for the sunshine. I thank you for the cooler weather we've had the last couple of days. Thank you also for the rain that you've provided. Father, I thank you for being able to gather together in your house, in your name. Lord, I thank you for the testimonies and the praises that were shared tonight. And Lord, I I thank you so much for how you work, how we can see you working, uh, if we will just open up our eyes and look. Lord, I thank you for caring for us and, and loving us so much. Father, I, I pray tonight as we look at this portion of scripture together that you would please give us understanding, that you would give us wisdom, and Lord, that your spirit would teach each one of us what we need to be taught. Lord, I know there are many different people here, uh, different needs different concerns, uh, and different areas of spiritual growth. So, Father, I pray that you would work in each heart individually. Lord, that you would teach what needs to be learned from your word. And, Lord, I pray that you'd help our hearts to be tender to receive it. Father, I thank you so much for bringing Marlene back to be with us. And, uh, Lord, I thank you for uh, just being able to pray for the needs of our church family. Lord, I know there are a couple of needs, um, medical things that are going on tomorrow. Uh, Lord, I, I pray for the people that are going to be having those procedures, Lord, that you would please guide the doctor's hands as they work, and Lord, that you would receive all the honor and glory in those situations. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for your love for us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, Numbers chapter 21 here. Uh, we had talked about last time how Israel had gotten to the land of Edom. Uh, remember... If you're looking at a map of Israel, there's Moab and Edom, and then kind of goes into the wilderness and, and the, the southern area of the Sinai Peninsula. Well, they had gotten turned away from Edom. Edom said, nope, we're not going to let you go through our land under any circumstances. They didn't go out to fight them, but they would not let them pass through their land. Now, there were two tribes or people groups, I guess you could call them, that Israel was not allowed to mess with at all. That was Moab and Ammon. Remember, those two were children um, from Lot. So they were under God's special protection. Uh, Israel wasn't allowed to take their land. God said, I will not give you any of the land of Esau. I do not give you any of the land of Moab or of Ammon. So you leave those people alone. They weren't always very friendly with Israel, uh, but there was never, Israel never was the aggressor if there was any sort of fighting because they were forbidden to do that by the Lord. But here in this chapter, we find a couple of other groups of Canaanite dwelling people who are not under divine protection. Uh, the first verse in 21 says, when King Arad, the Canaanite, which dwelt in the south, heard, that, heard tell that Israel came by the way of the spies, then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. And Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou wilt indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. And he called the name of the place Hormah. If you remember from a few chapters ago, Hormah was the name of the place where when Israel had tried to go into the promised land, when God said, I'm not going to be with you because you wouldn't obey, they had tried anyways. Um, the Canaanites had driven them back to the place called Hormah. That's at the end of chapter 14. So here they are again at the same place they were where they had experienced a defeat. But in this case, God grants them a victory. 
Now this little section right here, these first three verses, is kind of just a preview of what happens in the rest of the chapter. We'll, we'll talk about it a little more as we get to the second part of the chapter here. Um, but there are some things that usually cause people some consternation about this, this little portion of scripture here. Um, God specifically says, you probably noticed, um, that Israel was to utterly destroy these Canaanites. Um, we'll find out when we read the next half of this chapter, and also from what God says in Deuteronomy, they did destroy them utterly. They killed all the men, all the women, all the children. Uh, they burned the city to the ground. Now, when people who are not Christians, who are not believers, who do not study the word of God, when they hear something like that, they automatically ask all these questions and they throw all these questions at Christians. And a lot of times Christians don't know how to respond. They'll say things like, well, how could your God claim that he's loving when he basically just authorized Israel to genocide their neighbors, right? Didn't Jesus say, love your enemies? Well, if Jesus said, love your enemies, how come Israel is told to destroy their enemies? They're told to wipe them out. Isn't this the same as jihad, holy war, right? Sure, yeah, Israel can do it because they're God's people, right? What's going on here? How do we answer those tough questions? Uh, those, those statements that people like to throw out uh, that it really, if you don't know the truth, can cause a lot of doubt and a lot of confusion. We're going to look at those, not specifically right here in this passage. At the end of the chapter, we're going to look at them because the Bible expands a little bit more on, on how this works out. Uh, but ultimately... Um, we have to look and understand the context of what's going on. Um, context always determines meaning. It is very dangerous to take something out of Scripture and try to understand it all by itself. Uh, it just, it doesn't work. It's, it's like if you were to take, say if you looked at my life and you were to take my actions, my attitude, my, my mindset when I was 18 years old, if you were to just take that out and look at that, you would think I was an awful person. You really would. But that year of my life doesn't define me, thankfully. Um, God looks at the whole picture, and, and we have to look at the whole picture too, especially in the Word of God. So just a little bit of context here to, to understand what's going on. God wants Israel to be a set-apart people for himself, right? He wants them to be a kingdom of priests. God told Abraham, he said, I'm going to bless you. You will be a blessing. I will make your name great in the earth. And he said to Abraham, all nations would be blessed by you. So that's God's goal, to bless all nations of the world through Abraham or through the Hebrew people. Now, ultimately, that's in the person of Jesus Christ because Jesus died not only to pay for Israel's sins, but to pay for the, the sins of the whole world. So all people have been blessed. All nations are blessed by Israel. God promised this land, because we're talking about land, right? Israel is starting to conquer some of the land that God has promised them. God promised that to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. But we have to go back and look at Genesis just for a minute because there is an extremely important detail that we can't forget. Go to Genesis chapter 15, if you would, with me, just for a minute. Genesis chapter 15. God was talking to Abraham in a vision here and explaining what would happen in the future to Abraham. Uh, God said that uh, in the future, the Israelites would be strangers in a strange land. They would be in bondage uh, in the land of Egypt. And the Bible says in chapter 15 of Genesis, verse 13, they would be there for 400 years. But it, God said, I'm going to bring them out of Egypt, out of that strange nation, and I'm going to give them their own land, the land of Canaan, the place where you are, Abraham. That's going to be your descendants. But verse 16, God says, in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again. So they'll come back here. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. That seems like an awfully irrelevant thing to say back in Genesis. But by the time Moses and the people get to the land of Canaan, 
This statement is critical, critical. God said that the Israelites would be in bondage for 400 years. The time of the wandering in the wilderness, we know, has been almost 40 years up to this point. They're in the last year of their wandering. So it's been almost 440 years. God has allowed the, the sin meter, if you will, um, of these people, the Amorites in particular, to fill up. God has given them 440 years to repent. You might say, okay, well, what were they repenting of? Were they really such bad people? Um, as we look a little bit further into this, we will find out that, yes, they were such bad people. They were awful people. Um, by today's standards, they were awful people. Um, so putting it into context, what God tells Israel to do is rather fitting. We have to take a pause in that and look back at Numbers chapter 21. So go back there in your Bibles, if you would. Numbers chapter 21. There is an event that happens before there is any sort of other conquering in the land of Canaan. Um, so I want to look at this because it's next right in the scripture here. And then we'll go back to talking about exactly how all of that works. How does God tell them to destroy all their neighbors? And how, is that, how is that something that's right? How is that something that brings glory to God? But there's a little parentheses in there. So Numbers chapter 21, starting at verse 4, uh, and it goes down to verse 9. The Bible says, And they journeyed from Mount Hor, which is where um, Aaron died. And he uh, went to, uh, to be with the Lord. By the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. So they had to go around the land of Edom, right? They, they fought against this guy, Arad, the Canaanite, in the southern part there. He had taken some prisoners, but they... Israel fought against him. They, they defeated him, so God gave them a victory. But they still can't go through the land of Edom. So they have to go up and out towards the wilderness and all the way around the land of Edom to get anywhere near the land of Canaan again. So it says, And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Here's an interesting thing. Up till this point, the children of Israel, the Bible says they, have, they murmured against Moses or they complained against Moses and they spoke against Moses eight times so far. But this time, it says they spoke against God and against Moses. This is a little bit worse than what has been happening before. They've not, only, they've not spoken openly against the Lord before, but now they do. They, this is, they put themselves in a dangerous spot. Um, they say, wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Listen to what they say here. They say, for there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loathes this light bread. So they're complaining because there isn't any bread and water, which is a normal thing for them to complain about. However, there actually is bread. They've been being fed for 40 years with manna, from heaven. But look at what they call it, this light bread. I, I looked up what that meant because I thought it was kind of a strange way to describe bread. Maybe it just because it was fluffy. Well, that's not what they were saying. These men who had just fought Arad, the Canaanite, they were saying, hey, we need something a little more substantial than manna. This is like, this is food for kids and women. You know, we need men food. We need man bread. Uh, that's what they're saying, really. They're complaining that this food is not good enough and not giving them the strength and the sustenance that they really need. They're complaining about what God's given them. They're eating food that God says is angel's food. And they say, ugh, light bread. Ugh, we need something better, something stronger than that. You know when I read that, my mind immediately went to the New Testament where Jesus says in the book of John, I am the bread of life. How often do people have this same attitude toward Jesus? Don't people just think of the Bible as a, a bunch of children's stories? Oh, these are cute little stories. Noah's, Noah's Ark, you know, oh, it's a cute little Sunday school story. Jonah and the fish. Oh, it's, yeah, it's pretty great. People just have this idea that the Bible is just full of these cutesy little stories where 
God does something and people are happy and uh, it's not. It's truth. It's real. It's powerful. Uh, and as we see in this chapter, there's a lot of things in the Word of God that are definitely not children's stories. Um, there's some pretty, pretty awful things that happen. It's, it's real, factual, recorded truth from the mind of God. Uh, we got to be careful that, that we don't allow that attitude to influence us. We've got to be careful that we don't have such an attitude towards the Word of God or, or toward the things of the Lord, not just thinking, oh, those are, that's not really that important. Those are kind of just, it's just for kids or, it's not. Um, this, this is the, the strongest meat, <laughs> the, the best bread you can ever have. Uh, it's the best reading there is because it's truth, all of it. Um, so just a, kind of just a side note there. But an interesting, an interesting thing to complain about complaining about God's provision of manna. So verse 6, it says, And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. I assume that these people that died were still part of the, the group that God said, uh, you're going to die in the wilderness, you're not going to come back into the promised land, you're not going to be able to enter in because you didn't believe me, you wouldn't obey my commands. Remember, God said that whole generation would die, they would pass away before the next generation would be able to go in. But the next part of this is just strange. It really is. Verse 7, it says, therefore the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. That's unusual. That has not happened before. Uh, the people have not ever spoken out against the Lord before. This is a really severe punishment. But here the people are admitting that they've sinned. It's different. They said, we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. This really is a picture of repentance. I haven't pointed out repentance any other time when we've been studying what Israel has been doing because there hasn't been any. There has been, there's been sin. There's been murmuring and complaining against Moses and against what the Lord's doing. And then God deals with it. He sends some sort of punishment, and they stop. But there's been no repentance up till now. So it's almost like this, I can only guess here, but it's almost like this new generation is starting to have some effect on how the nation of Israel interacts with the Lord. Their hearts are softer. Instead of being unwilling to admit their sin and unwilling to repent, now they are. They're willing to admit that they've done wrong when, they've, when they're corrected here. They're willing to say, we've sinned. We're sorry. Uh, pray for us. Ask God to fix this problem. So Moses does. His solution, though, is, is odd. It's very odd. Verse 8, it says, The Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, so like a snake, a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten when he looketh upon it, shall live. Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Have you ever seen the, the symbol for the, the medical symbol? It's a stick with a snake around it. That's where this comes from. Uh, it's a strange thing that they would use it for a medical uh, symbol because the snake brought healing just by looking at it. I don't think normally when you go to the doctor they bring any sort of healing just by looking at it. Um, but that's the symbol that they've chosen. But it's strange, isn't it? That really all that was Moses took a stick, he made a bronze snake and made it you know, hang on the stick and he stuck it out in the middle of the camp and if people were bitten by these serpents, which the wilderness was full of, God brought them in, though, to punish his people and to turn their hearts back to him, all they had to do was look at it. That seems, to me, that seems very strange. Um, it, it would make more sense if there was some sort of ointment you would put on or, or some sort of healing that, you know. But no, it, all it was was they simply had to look at the snake. But why did God do that? He had a reason. 
Jesus said in the New Testament, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. That word lifted up is the same word that is used here when Moses put the serpent on the pole. The serpent was lifted up on the pole. It was lifted up from the ground. There's an interesting verse in Isaiah chapter 45. Don't necessarily need to turn there, but um, I'll read it for you. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22. God says this, Look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. Look unto me. Jesus said in John chapter 3, some very, very interesting words related to this. I'm just going to read them for you. John chapter 3. These are before the verses that everyone knows. John 3.16. <clears throat> Jesus says in John 3.14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. I think the reason, and really the only reason, God had Moses make this brass serpent that people just looked at was as a picture of what Jesus Christ would do. Just, how simple is it to look at something? Incredibly simple. You, you don't have to do anything. Just like looking at that serpent is what healed you, Looking to Jesus is what heals you from your sin. There is no act you have to do. There's no ritual you have to do. There's no uh, magic ointment or anything you put on. There, there's none of that. All it is is simple faith in Jesus Christ. I think that's why God did this in Numbers 21 because it, it's, it's so strange, but it was so simple. And Praise the Lord that salvation is simple. Uh, we were talking about that with our little guy today. And he understands. He's seven years old. And he understands salvation. Praise the Lord. So back in Numbers chapter 21. Those are our parentheses here. Verse 10, it says, And the children of Israel set forward. I like those words, set forward. It's kind of got the idea of now they're moving forward. They're not running around in circles in the wilderness anymore. They've got a purpose. They have a goal in mind. Like, like Paul said, I press toward the mark. I'm trying to finish a race. I've got something in mind that I'm accomplishing. They set forward and pitched in Oboth. And they journeyed from Oboth and pitched in, this is a hard one, I Jabarim, I think, <laughs> in the wilderness, which is before Moab, toward the sun rising. From thence they removed and pitched in the valley of Zared. From thence they removed and pitched on the other side of Arnon, which is in the wilderness that cometh out of the coasts of the Amorites. For Arnon is on the border of Moab, between Moab and the Amorites. Wherefore it is said in the book of the wars of the Lord, uh, that's mentioned in Exodus 17, by the way, that book where Joshua was supposed to record the acts of valor that Israel had accomplished. So there's a, a book that's specifically just the military conquests of Israel, the book of the wars of the Lord what he did in the Red Sea and in the brooks of Arnon and at the stream of the brooks that goeth down upon the dwelling of Ar and lieth upon the border of Moab. Now, this was just a, a way to remember God's mighty works and what he had done for them. Uh, verse 16, this is interesting. You remember how the people of Israel had been complaining about not having water? Well, here God supplies some water for them in an interesting way. From thence they went to Beer, and that is the well whereof the Lord spake unto Moses, gather the people together, and I will give them water. Now notice, this time, there's no complaining about water. God just said, I'm going to provide water. The people had not complained about it like they did before, remember? That's what got them in trouble with the fiery serpents. This time, there was no complaining. Um, and God said, I will provide them water. Verse 17, then Israel sang this song, spring up, O well, sing ye unto it. The princes digged the well, the nobles of the people digged it by the direction of the lawgiver with their staves. And from the wilderness, they went to Matanah. Uh, kind of a, a total flip in, in K 
character for the Israelites. There's no complaining. God says, I'm going to provide water. They trust him to do it. They sing unto the Lord this time. There's not murmuring and complaining. There's singing. There's joy. And it's really cool because it says the princes dig the well. So those are like the leaders of the people. They're the ones who are getting the water here. But look how it says they, they got water. The princes dig the well. The nobles of the people digged it by the direction of the lawgiver. That was Moses with their staves. You know what staves are? Anybody know? Sticks. Do you dig a well with sticks? No. <laughs> what do you do with sticks? You poke things or hit people. Yeah. <laughs> you hit things or poke things. What all they did here was God said, I'm going to provide water. You send all the nobles of the people out with their sticks and start poking holes in the ground. That's all they did. They, they digged a well by poking their stick in the ground and there up came water. That's incredible. That's a miracle. If God did provide water. The people had to do a little bit of work for it. Not much. They poked their sticks in the ground and got water. That, I just thought that was, that was neat. But how... How amazing to see their attitude has totally shifted into instead of one that's complaining against the Lord, now they're trusting the Lord. Now they're singing, they're rejoicing, and, and God says, hey, I'll give you water. <laughs> Go poke the ground. There it is. It's incredible. From there, they move from Matanah to Neheliel, from Neheliel to Bamoth. In verse 20, from Bamoth in the valley, that is the country of Moab, to the top of Pisgah, which looketh toward Jeshimon. Mount Pisgah is the mountain where Moses eventually would be uh, taken home to be with the Lord. He was able to view the promised land from Mount Pisgah, uh, but he would not enter in himself. But that doesn't happen until the end of the book of Deuteronomy. <laughs> so a lot happens between there. Um, and he'll come back. Um, it's, yeah, they, it, there's, there's quite a lot that happens in between there. Pisgah and Nebo, important mountains there. So, those are uh, those those happen. Those things happened in between the conquering of Arad, the Canaanite, and the two guys we're going to read about just here. So it says that in verse twenty one, Israel sent messengers unto Sihon, king of the Amorites, saying, "Let me pass through thy land. We will not turn into the fields or into the vineyards. We will not drink of the waters of the well." But we will go along by the king's highway until we be past thy borders. Same thing they had said to Edom. But Sihon would not suffer Israel to pass through his border. Now, there's an interesting note here. I have to read it to you. Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 30. This is the divine commentary on these words that we're reading here in Numbers. Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 30. God says, but Sihon, king of Heshbon, would not let us pass by, for the Lord thy God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate that he might deliver him into thy hand as appeareth this day. Just like Pharaoh, this guy's heart was hardened by the Lord, hardened not against his will, but hardened to his will. He wanted to go defeat Israel, and he wanted to be the one to protect the land of Canaan. Um, Sihon and also his buddy Og, they were two of giant race. The Bible talks about giants. You know probably the most famous one, Goliath. There were a lot of men like that back in these days, and these two men were known for that. The Bible talks about Og having a bed that was uh, like this giant nine and a half cubit long bed that he had to sleep in because he was huge. So these aren't just anybody. These aren't silly little people running around with pitchforks and shovels. These are well-trained soldiers. They're, they're armed men. But God hardened his heart that he would not allow them to pass. It says in verse 23 of Numbers here, Numbers 21, uh, But Sihon gathered all his people together and went out against Israel into the wilderness. And he came to Jahaz and fought against Israel. And Israel smote him with the edge of the sword and possessed his land from Arnon even to Jabok even unto the children of Ammon, for the border of the children of Ammon was strong. Well, that was okay, because they weren't allowed to take any of their land. It says that Israel took all these cities, and Israel dwelt in all the cities of the Amorites, in Heshbon and in all the villages thereof. For Heshbon was the city of Sihon, king of the Amorites, who had fought against the former king of Moab, 
and had taken all his land out of his hand, even unto Arnon. Wherefore they speak in Proverbs, they that speak in Proverbs say, Come into Heshbon, let the city of Sion be built and prepared. For there is a fire gone out of Heshbon, a flame of the city of, Mo- of Sion. It hath consumed Ar of Moab and the lords of the high places of Arnon. Woe unto thee, Moab, thou art undone, O people of Chemosh. He hath given his sons that escaped and his daughters into captivity unto Sion, king of the Amorites. We have shot at them. Heshbon is perished even unto Debon. We have laid them waste even unto Nophah, which reacheth unto Mediba. Thus Israel dwelt in the land of the Amorites. And Moses sent to spy out Jazer, and they took the villages thereof and drove out the Amorites that were there. That bit of scripture is given to us to explain that these Amorites were not um, were not like village dwelling people who were unarmed and untrained in war. It says a fire went out. When he desired to take the cities of Moab, he took them. Uh, he just he obliterated everybody who was in front of him. He was a powerful warlord. And I said when we came back to this, I would explain exactly why God was doing what he was doing. That verse in Genesis 15 is key, um, that the iniquity of the Amorites was not yet full. I believe that every nation has a sin meter, that God keeps track of the sin and the iniquity of the nation, and once it reaches full, judgment happens. And that nation, unless they repent and turn to the Lord, they're gone. Um, We see that throughout history. You don't even have to look in the Bible. You can look throughout history and see that nations seem to only last at a maximum about 300 years. And then their power is gone, their, their people are scattered, and they, they just seem to dissipate. And it's, it seems strange because it's a pattern that you see over and over and over and over again. But I believe that's why. Um, just exactly this reason here. But there is another reason that's important. If you go to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 9, Deuteronomy chapter 9, God says in Deuteronomy 9, uh, in verse 5, he says, Not for thy righteousness or for the uprightness of thine heart dost thou go to possess their land. So he's talking to Israel here. He says, It's not because you guys are righteous and good, but for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee, that he may perform the word of which the Lord sware unto thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Understand, therefore, that the Lord thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it for thy righteousness, for thou art a stiff-necked people. God very clearly says it is not because Israel is better than these Canaanites. Although, what I'm about to tell you, I think you will probably think they they were better. Uh, God says their wickedness. I started to look into a little bit of what the, specifically the Amorites were known for. You might remember a group of people called the Ninevites. I mentioned the story of Jonah earlier. Um, the city of Nineveh was kind of an, it was an Amorite possession originally. So I'm assuming they're probably Amorite people who left or fled and maybe came back and resettled. I don't, I don't know exactly how that worked. They were known for being uh, war, people of war. They were, that was... If you were a man of honor in that city, it was because you were a warrior. It was a culture that glorified fighting. Uh, there were also cultures that glorified immorality. Um, that doesn't really change throughout history. There's a lot of cultures that did that. Um, the way that they would worship their false gods involved a lot of prostitution, uh, very sexual things, uh, completely immoral society. But on top of that, when we read in the Bible about what God says, he says, not only to destroy the men, but also the women and the children. That, that doesn't really sit well with us because of the laws of warfare that kind of govern how most of the world fights. Uh, we, we don't do that. Back in these days, um, these people sacrificed their own children, um, usually more than one per family. They had a lot of children, but they worshiped a god called Molech. Has anybody ever heard of Molech? Okay, a few. Um, Molech was an idol. I hate to even say this. Um, He was an idol that they worshipped, and it was an iron god. 
And Molech, if you saw a Molech idol, uh, you would see him standing like this. Molech had his, his hands out. Molech was basically a furnace. Uh, what they would do is they would heat him up, and I'm sure you know iron gets hot. Um, it's what my stove is made out of in my house. It gets real hot, and it keeps the house warm. Molech's hands were out like this because uh, at very regular intervals, people would offer their children to Molech to guarantee uh, the fertility of their crops, to protect them from enemies, uh, you name it. Uh, those children were not dead when they offered them to Molech. They would, they would place babies in Molech's arms. Um, people talk about abortion today, and it, it is horrible, but this was, this was awful. This is, this is just... I don't even really have words to describe how bad that is. When, when the moral level of your society is so corrupt that you would offer your own children to an iron god so that your corn grows, that's only a, just one example. They worshipped many false gods in many different ways. These people were extremely wicked. And when you know that, it really kind of puts things in perspective. All of a sudden, the people that you might have felt bad for, the people that you might have said, boy, the Israelites are sure being unkind to them. Um, all of a sudden, you realize, boy, <laughs> 440 years is an awful long time to allow that to go on. That is an awful long time for repentance. Um, God is a God of mercy. I don't know about you, but if I knew about those things, I would not allow those people to have 440 years to repent. I'd probably allow them to have 440 seconds. Uh, God is much more patient than we are. And, and he allowed that amount of time for them to change. But they didn't. Uh, their, their evil got worse and worse and worse. And I imagine it was probably similar to what it was in the days of Noah, where God said, everything that is going on before me is wicked continually. All the thoughts of their minds are evil continually. God knows that. I don't. So this is what they went into. Uh, in verse 33 here, it says, They turned and went up by the way of Bashan, and Og the king of Bashan went out against them, he and all his people, to the battle of Edri. And the Lord said unto Moses, Fear him not, for I have delivered him into thy hand, and all his people and his land. Thou shalt do to him as thou did unto Sihon, king of the Amorites, which dwelt at Heshbon. So they smote him and his sons and all his people until there were none left him alive and they possessed his land. Um, as you continue on through the book of, really the book of Numbers and Deuteronomy and then Joshua and Judges, all the people that are taken over, this is not the case. You will not find God telling Israel to utterly destroy everyone. Most of them, actually, God just says, drive them out. Um, Kick them out of their cities, let them go dwell somewhere else, but, or put them under tribute. God doesn't instruct this kind of action to everyone, so just know that. But these he did because their, their wickedness had gotten full. Their, their sin had reached unto the heavens, and it had, it had gotten high enough that God was going to deal with it. Uh, there are a lot of good applications we could make from this chapter, um, but I just really want to make two for you and I. The first is to have a heart like these Israelites we saw in the second half of the chapter, not in the first half. In the first half, their hearts were proud, they were arrogant, and they thought they knew what they needed, and they didn't trust God. But in the second half, their hearts were tender. They trusted God. They were able to rejoice, uh, and they, they even spent time in song, in the desert because of God's provision for them. You know, we get to choose how we're known. Uh, we get to choose what kind of attitude we have. We don't really get to choose our circumstances. We don't get to choose much of what God brings into our lives, but we do get to choose how we respond to it. These people are learning to respond in a way that God can work with, that God can use. So that's the first challenge, um, to have a right attitude and a right mindset when God brings those challenges in. And the second one is, is really just very simple, to pray for our country. Um, when, you, when you learn things like what I just told you 
Um, it might make America sound not so bad, uh, like things really are <laughs> pretty good. They are. They really are. Uh, even compared to a lot of other nations around the world, uh, America is still, there's much freedom, there's much righteousness in America. But the corruption and the wickedness and the evil grows and grows and grows. Uh, one of the things I pray for is for mercy. Um, God is not ignorant. God has not turned a blind eye to what is happening and has happened. Um, so I pray that God would have compassion on America, that for the sake of those people in this country who love him, uh, he would show mercy. He would extend mercy. I would love for Jesus Christ to return and everything to be set right, because it will when he returns. But I also understand that him delaying his coming is the same thing he was doing for these Amorites. Time to repent. Time to repent. Time to repent. We understand that. So that's why the gospel, the message of hope that Jesus gives is, is crucial. Because there's all these little issues of sin. Like abortion is one of them that we mentioned tonight. That's, that's a symptom. That's not a root cause. The root cause is godlessness. If, if people knew the Lord, if people followed Jesus, that would take care of itself. Um, so we need to pray for this nation to come to Christ, really, above, above anything else. So I challenge you to do that, to make sure that when you are faced with challenges, you respond the right way. And it's a learning experience. I'm still learning the right way to respond to things. So I'm not standing over here. I've got it figured out. I haven't. But we need to constantly be learning to grow closer to the Lord, trusting him, having those right responses, and also being on our knees for this country. We live here. Our children live here. Your grandchildren live here. Um, it's a place that needs prayer, for sure. Father, I thank you for this lesson from your word tonight. Lord, I thank you for what you did. Lord, I, I don't pretend to fully understand it and to know why you did some of the things that you did, but Lord, I trust you. I trust that it is right because you only do what's right. You only do what is good. And Father, I thank you so much for your long suffering, for your patience, for your mercy. Thank you for how I've seen that in my own life personally and, and in our country. So Father, I pray for our church, Lord, that you would help us to keep short accounts of our sin with you. Lord, that, that we would be right before you that we'd constantly be coming before you and making sure that we're clean and that we're serving you. Lord, I also pray for our nation. Lord, uh, you are not blind to what is happening and what has happened. And Father, I pray that you would please have mercy on us. Lord, forgive us for the sin we have committed. Forgive us for turning our backs on you. Forgive us for driving you out of our schools, out of our public places, Lord, of, of doing so many things that you are not pleased with. Father, I pray that you would bring this country back to yourself. Lord, that you would bring the gospel in front of people, that they would see it and believe it, that they would turn to you. Father, I know it's, that's a big thing to ask, but it's something that you can do. Lord, I pray that you would do that, that you would use us. Use your church, Lord. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for loving us. And Lord, I thank you for my brothers and sisters. Lord, I pray you would please bless them. Please go with us as we go from here tonight and bring us back together again to worship you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good night. God bless you. Thank you for being here tonight.